Well, good afternoon. Um, the organisers suggested that for this talk I should use the title The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, but I thought that might lead to too many disagreements with my collaborators, so we settled on this instead. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about this rather unlikely trio and the work that we conducted on a project called Music from the Genome. Uh, this was a project that involved the creation of uh, an original large-scale choral work using genetic sequences uh, with a piece of genuine scientific research, an investigation into the genetic characteristics of choral singers. Now, we weren't the first people by far to think of using genetic sequences in music. There are hundreds of examples online, but I think we were the first to use the individual genetic sequences from the performers themselves to create their parts. And when I went to speak to Michael Zev Gordon, the composer, when we first came up with the idea, uh, I had to do a bit of explaining. I had to explain to him that the, the human genome can be seen as a sequence, 3,000 million units long, and that uh, each one of those units can only be one of four things, G, A, T, and C. And like many musicians before him, he realized straight away that three of those letters fall in the normal Western musical scale. And when I asked him about the fourth, the T, uh, he reminded me that, that doe is a deer, a female deer, and that T is a drink with jam and bread that brings us back to doe. So in the scale of C, it's the seventh note of the scale, or a B. We talked a little bit about what sort of work this should be, and we settled fairly quickly on a choral work, and I wanted something that would reflect genetic diversity, so I wanted a large number of people. So we, we settled on 40. There's already one or two very famous choral works with 40 parts in, uh, so we went with that. And the next decision that we had to make was which bit of the genome were we going to use? Clearly, 3,000 million units would produce something rather Wagnerian in scale, and I don't think we were looking at something like that. So I suggested to him that uh, the genome is so diverse that he could more or less write any sequence he wants, that, that appealed to him using those four notes, and I was sure we'd be able to find it somewhere in the genome. And in fact, I, I gave him an example. So I came up with this theme here. Uh, this is dum dum ba dum 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 and I entered it into some software and interrogated the genome, and uh, lo and behold, uh, that sequence appears about halfway through uh, chromosome 12. And uh, if you look at it here, here it is in the sequence. <laughs> dum dum ba dum 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 at that point, Michael had to sit down and explain a little bit about the creative mind to me. Uh, he said that, in fact, most creative people don't like absolute freedom. They normally set themselves some boundaries. So whether it's a poet choosing a rhyming scheme or a visual artist uh, using a particular medium, uh, there, are, there are limits. And, and he asked me to set the limits. So I said, well, the logical piece of genome to use would be something that we're already looking at in the choral singers. In our, in our study, we were comparing the DNA of 250 choral singers uh, with 250 non-musicians. And we were looking specifically at two genes involved in brain biochemistry. And within those genes, we were looking at a handful of something called polymorphisms. Now, you're probably all aware that uh, most of us are genetic. We're, we're, we're very close to being genetically identical in this room. We share about 99.5% of our DNA. But at several million points on the genome, uh, there are uh, places where sections of the population differ from others. It's rather like... Um, a misprint in a print run of a book. It always crops up at the same place, and a proportion of books will be different from, from the rest. And I suggested that we use a polymorphism called the RS3 polymorphism. And this is a polymorphism just upstream from one of the genes we were looking at, the AVPR1A gene. So we talked a little bit about this, and he said, well, well why are you looking at that one? And so I found myself explaining that when scientists do these sort of studies, what they do is they normally look for a bit of the genome that is known to have some sort of biological effect. And usually the first place they look is the animal world. Oh yeah, here's the, uh, here's the sequence here, the musical sequence, which coincidentally was just upstream from the gene we were looking at. That's the bum 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 from earlier on. So the first animals that we looked at were, were voles, and these two are voles that are very closely related. Um, they both have the AVPR1A gene, um, and while they don't have the RS3 polymorphism, the prairie vole there on the left uh, has a sequence of DNA that's sort of jammed into the genome a bit upstream, which is analogous to the RS3 polymorphism. These voles are very interesting because although they're closely related, they behave very differently. So the prairie vole uh, is a highly social creature, exhibits good pair bonding, uh, is, uh, is very monogamous, whereas the montane vole is highly promiscuous and not much good at pair bonding. 
the other interesting thing is that if you take the insertion sequence out of the prairie vole, in other words, if you breed a line of prairie voles without that sequence, their behavior becomes rather more like that of their naughty cousins. Now, the relevance of this might not seem immediately apparent unless you're proposing some sort of relationship <laughs> with a vole. But when we look at the associations in the human genome, we can start to see from the first three, it's all starting to, to make a bit, a bit of sense. The, this polymorphism is something to do with social behavior. The last two items on this list cropped up in the year or two before we actually conducted the study, and they're really what sort of directed us towards this polymorphism uh, from the outset. So here's the polymorphism itself. There's our musical theme at the top in red. The polymorphism's in lilac in the middle. Uh, and it differs in length between different people. Unfortunately, of course, when we started the project, we hadn't done the genetic analysis on our singers. So I had to give Michael something to kick off with. So I gave him the sequences either side of the polymorphism. And those are in yellow there. And he took those and, and absolutely rigorously turned them into music. And these are, this is the opening bar of the piece, and these are, this is the base sequence leading up to the polymorphism that you just saw. Mystery, you can just hear the opening bars now. So that was pretty good. We were quite pleased with that. And then a few months later, we got the sequence, we got the results from the labs back from the individual performers. So these are 40 singers, and we ended up with uh, results for each of them. Now, these results took the form of numbers uh, to represent the length of the polymorphism in each singer. And again, some of you may know that we have two versions of each of our 35,000 genes. We get one from mum and one from dad. So the results I was able to give to Michael were two separate numbers, somewhere between 319 and 349. And what he did was he took those numbers and he created in each singer's part, just about two-thirds of the way through the piece, two phrases, a phrase for each uh, allele. Allele is the term that we use to describe the different forms that a polymorphism can take. And so uh, here are our first two singers, uh, Hot from the Lab. And this is in the build-up to the climax of the piece. You can just begin to hear the phrases now. So this is actually the genetic sequence belonging to that singer. And this is the next singer coming in. The music builds up to a massive climax, which uh, we'll hear in just a moment. But before we do so, I'd like to um, introduce the third member of our team, Ruth Padell, the poet. Now, she wrote some absolutely fantastic words for this. And uh, she added a very neo-Darwinian flavor to this in, a, in an extremely literal sense, because uh, as some of you may know, she is the great-granddaughter of Charles Darwin himself. And the combination of her words and the fantastic sound of 40 voices led to some really quite extraordinary musical moments. And the whole piece you can hear on the project uh, website. Um, what about the scientific results? Well, of course, the RS3 polymorphism about which we had crafted the entire piece turned out to be exactly the same between the choral singers and the uh, non-musicians. Uh, but I was delighted to find uh, that, in fact, the other gene we were looking at did differ between the two groups, and those results have just been published. Now, we did a lot of talks as we uh, went on with the project, a lot of seminars and workshops, and we gradually built quite, quite a sort of uh, cohesive spirit. And we, we used to refer to ourselves in the latter stages as the three musketeers. But those of you with sharp eyes or those who know their Dumas uh, will know that, of course, the three musketeers uh, had a, a fourth uh, uh, come and join them. Uh, Ruth, Michael, and I are now rested. We're ready to start our next project, and we're looking for some fantastic ideas. So it's good that I'm here today. Uh, but I would just urge you, if anyone out there feels they might have something to offer, please come and chat to me during the break. Thanks very much indeed.